This is Divorce Court, presided over by Judge William Keene. In the case we'll be seeing today, Lana Cross is suing Tony Cross, her husband of three years, for divorce on the grounds of adultery and mental cruelty. Mr. Cross is countersuing on grounds of mental cruelty. All right, I have this case of Cross versus Cross on the calendar today. I'll hear that case now. Ms. Polk, do you desire to make an opening statement? Yes, Your Honor. The evidence will show that Mr. Cross not only cruelly ridiculed his wife's profession in an attempt to further his own career, he also committed adultery with the wife of one of Mrs. Cross's potential investors. And Mrs. Cross now asks that she be granted this divorce on the grounds of mental cruelty and adultery, and that she be awarded the family home valued at $65,000, the furnishings valued at $19,000, the $10,000 savings account, and spousal support in the amount of $1,500 a month. Thank you. Mr. Romer, do you want to uh, reserve your opening statement or make it now? I'll make mine now, Your Honor. All right. Your Honor, it is going to be shown that Mrs. Cross's self-centeredness and irrational jealousy not only destroyed the marriage, but also greatly injured the career of Mr. Cross. As a result, he sues for divorce on the grounds of mental cruelty. He's willing to split bank assets of $10,000. However, he wishes to re retain control of the condominium and furnishings and wishes to pay no spousal support. Thank you. Call your first witness, please. Yes, Your Honor, Lana Cross. Step forward. About to testify is the plaintiff, Lana Cross. Mrs. Cross, a ballerina, has spent most of her dancing career in Europe. She met her husband of three years while he was playing for the Italian Professional Basketball League. I do. All right, let me hear from the plaintiff. Yes, Your Honor. Mrs. Cross, how did you, a ballet dancer, meet and fall in love with a professional basketball player? We actually met in Verona, Italy, at a shrine to Romeo and Juliet. Tony was quite the gentleman. I remember the long walks down the narrow streets. We were both busy with our careers, so it was difficult to continue the relationship, but we'd find a couple of days here and there. We married in Florence nine months after we met. Did you have any concerns about his playing basketball? My only concern was for his health. He was getting hurt more and more. After he sprained his back in a game, I told him to take it easy. He said, I may be over 30, but I'm not over the hill like you. It was our first real fight in over two years. I had never seen him that angry. Was your husband sensitive about his age? Yes. I noticed he was competing insanely with the younger players, both on and off the court. After a hard-played game in Rome, he accepted a challenge from one of the rookies to play one-on-one. -on -one. He fell and wrenched his shoulder badly. How long did this behavior continue? He suffered a stress fracture in his ankle, trying some fancy dribble. And when he discovered he couldn't play anymore, he got sullen, nasty, and critical. How did you react to his criticism? I pretended he didn't bother me. But it really hurt. He made me wonder if he really loved me. All the affection was suddenly gone, and, and we were barely speaking. He was consumed with bitterness. In desperation, I suggested we take an extended trip back home to the States and get away from careers. We settled in Tony's hometown, where he was still somewhat of a celebrity from his college days. How did your relocation work out? Not very well. The first week back, a local committee headed by Charles and Bettina Evans came to me asking me to start up a ballet company in town. Tony laughed when I told him. And then he agreed to help me raise the financial backing. Did you succeed in raising your money? No. I had invited Charles and Bettina Evans over to talk ballet. Tony did nothing but talk basketball. He even took Charles out to the driveway and shot baskets. Well, by the time they got back, Tony was full of this idiotic idea to start up a basketball team in Italy, and he had convinced Charles Evans to back him financially. How did this sudden plan to start a basketball team affect you? He just stole my best prospect for backing, that's all. And then he got so caught up in his scheme that he wouldn't help me at all. He promised to appear with me at an arts council meeting, but he didn't even show up. And that night, I find out he's gone to Italy. Did he go to Italy alone? He claimed he was going with Charles Evans. But when I called him in Italy late one night, Bettina Evans answered the phone. When Tony came on the phone, he gave me some silly story about a business conference. Right, at 3 a.m. Did you consider leaving him? Oh, I guess I kept remembering those long walks in Verona, and I kept hoping. Then I got a chance to dance the lead in a New York production of Romeo and Juliet. Tony didn't even show, at least not in the audience. After the performance, I went exhausted to my dressing room, and there I found him making love to Bettina Evans. Thank you, Mrs. Cross. I have no further questions. Cross-examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Mrs. Cross, at the time you kept reminding Tony about his age, wasn't he the leading scorer in his league? Well, that was just because he was pushing so hard. He couldn't have kept it up. 
Well, at the same time, uh, weren't several lead roles, those of Cinderella and Giselle, taken away from you and given to younger dancers? That was just because a new director had joined the company. He had a different artistic conception of the ballets. It had nothing to do with my dancing or my age. Come on, Mrs. Cross. In truth, didn't you begin your assault on Tony's age only after you began to lose your own abilities? I'm in my prime. I'm three years younger than Tony. Isn't it true that when Tony first offered to help you start your company, you refused to help, you refused, refused his help, stating, and I quote, I don't need a dumb jock bringing down the tone of this project? I didn't say that. I didn't think he really wanted to help. When you discovered how popular and influential he is in this town, you certainly wanted his help then, didn't you? No, I never demanded anything like that. I was building my company on my reputation. Didn't Charles Evans initially discuss the idea of an Italian team with Tony? The agreement was that he helped me. He betrayed me. Well, didn't sexual relations with your husband end before the trip to Italy because you became so obsessed with your company? They ended because he didn't want me anymore. He had Bettina. Uh, Your Honor, I move to strike the last portion of that answer. All right, that was not responsive, and I'll strike it. Go ahead. Thank you. Isn't it true that you made the call to Tony in Italy at 3 a.m. local time, meaning that it would be midday there and a perfect time for a business lunch? I only heard Bettina. And if it was so innocent, why did she say she was the maid at first? After you and Tony separated, did you not lie to Charles Evans to convince him to drop support of Tony's team? I went to see Charles because I felt he ought to know what kind of woman he was married to. And after you talked to Mrs. Mr. Evans, isn't it true that you threw a car manual at Tony's face and said to him, and again, I quote, I have fixed it so that you'll have to learn an honest trade. I was hurt and angry. I don't remember what I said. No further questions, Your Honor. All right, you may step down. Let me see counsel bench, please. While Lana Cross leaves the stand, we have time for a short break. We return now to divorce court, about to testify on behalf of Lana Cross as Olga Petrovna, a ballet teacher. Ms. Polk, let me hear from this witness. Yes, Your Honor. Ms. Petrovna, did you witness any examples of the way Mr. Cross treated his wife? Once at a ballet party, he made a complete fool of himself. He said that her dying swan reminded him of Daffy Duck. He actually had the nerve to get up and mimic her. Can you tell us about the benefit ballet that you and Mrs. Cross staged? Yes, Mrs. Cross created one piece just for the local audience only. And Tony agreed to be the guest host, but instead he did everything to ruin the evening. He brought in an actual basketball and did a slam dunk and knocked over a couple of dancers. Can you tell us what you saw at a meeting of the ballet guild? Certainly. At the end of the meeting, I see Tony. I think he is with Mrs. Cross. So I look around, no Mrs. Cross. So I follow him. And to my surprise, outside the meeting, he meets with Bettina Evans. And arm in arm, they go to his car. And there, they kiss. Thank you, I have no further questions. Cross-examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Petrovna. Wasn't the benefit referred to earlier a great success with Tony Cross's performance getting good reviews? The newspaper found it amusing. That was not the intention. Haven't you spent a good deal of time belittling Mr. Cross, saying things like, you've given new meaning to the word dumb jock? That was after the debacle of the benefit. If he chooses to behave like a buffoon, I will call him a buffoon. Did you tell Mrs. Cross, once the slam dunker is out of the picture, we can get on to the important business of the ballet school? The marriage was over. I was trying to get Mrs. Cross to face the future. Isn't it true that you were filling Mrs. Cross's heads with lies, simply so that you could secure the position as the ballet mistress at her new school? I never tell lies. I am here to defend a great artist from her husband's lies. No further questions, Your Honor. Sorry, you may step down. Ms. Polk, call your next witness, please. Your Honor, the plaintiff rests. Mr. Romer, call your first witness. Your Honor, I call Tony Cross to the stand. All right, Mr. Cross, step forward. About to testify is the defendant, Tony Cross. Mr. Cross is accused by his wife of having an affair with Bettina Evans. She also testified that he belittled her profession and made fun of her ability to dance. I do. All right, let me hear from the defendant. 
What attracted to you to Lana in the first place? I suppose it was her singleness of purpose. She committed herself totally to being a great companion and lover. But when I tried to fit into her world, it seemed like Lana was ashamed of me. Every time I asked to go to a cast party, she'd say something like, uh, these people are artists, not basketball fans. You'd be out of place. Did you do anything to try to bring your two worlds together? I signed up for a beginning dance class that she was teaching. My first day there, she gives the uh, class instructions in French. I asked her to explain. She got all aloof and said, uh, if I was that ignorant, I had no business there. How did that affect you? It hurt. I, uh, I tried to get her to talk about it, but all she said was I couldn't expect to fit in with her friends, that uh, bouncing a basketball doesn't prepare one for the finer things in life. She also said that nothing else was bothering her, but I could tell better. Did you find out what it was? I think so. Uh, she had lost a couple of her better roles to younger dancers. So she had excuses, uh, like one girl was sleeping with the director. So I started to watch her dance. But there's one thing I know about, it's timing. Hers was off. Did you tell her, you tell her your thoughts on this? Yeah, I suggested that uh, in the off-season we go to Paris and she could take a master's class. Well, she hit the roof. She said, how dare I criticize her that uh, my career was the one that was dead. I should have quit years ago. <sighs> then uh, she lost another important role, and uh, she blew up at the ballet master. She told me she was fired on the spot. Well, that night I talked her into the trip home, you know, get our bearings straight. Maybe restart the fire in our marriage. Did the trip home help the two of you? No. The day we arrived, Olga Petrovna gave Lana this idea about starting a ballet company. Well, I tried to get her to see the business side of it, but uh, she freaked out. She said, you're either for me or against me. What else could I do? I, I tried to help her. Well, what did you do to help her? I uh, made a list of people I thought she should talk to. I, uh, I even called them up and paved the way. I went on the TV and the radio talk shows. I put my reputation on the line for her and never a thank you, just what can you do for me next? And Tony, how successful were your efforts? Not very. But Lana couldn't see that it wasn't me that was the problem. Nobody wanted to support the thing. She told me it was all my fault. Then she quit sleeping with me. And when Charles Evans uh, proposed starting a team, that really set her off. I mean, I, I went to Italy partly to check out my chances, but partly to let things at home cool off. Well, what happened after you returned from Italy? Lana was just torching herself with jealousy over Mrs. Evans and me. She told me the only way I could get ahead was to seduce Charles Evans' wife. Well, it was crazy. I mean, I tried to ignore it and concentrate on helping her arrange the performance of Romeo and Juliet in New York. Well, what happened the night of the benefit? I was backstage in Lana's dressing room arranging a surprise party for afterwards, and uh, Mrs. Evans comes in to tell me that Charles has agreed to back the team. So I give her a hug, and Lana walks in. Well, she just wouldn't listen. Out of pure spite, she went straight to Charles. Charles and his wife are now separated. She destroyed their marriage and my hopes for a future. No further questions, Your Honor. Cross-examination. Yes, Your Honor, Mr. Cross, far from being the sensitive, supportive husband, didn't you say, and I quote, I'm glad you're losing the big roles. You were getting too self-impressed anyway. Those were not my exact words. I. I wanted her to take a step back, get some perspective, put a plan together. Maybe it wouldn't bother her so much. Was that why you read a bad review of Lana's performance of Sleeping Beauty out loud at a restaurant, laughing the entire time? She asked me to read it to her. Maybe I did laugh a little. It was funny. The real reason your wife left her job in Italy was to be with you after your injury. Isn't that true? She was fired. Now that I look back on it, I don't think she would have paid much attention to me if she hadn't been. Once you arrived in the United States, didn't you regularly say things in public like Lana's pas de deux was as bad in bed as an on stage? That was after she had insulted me in front of my best friends. I was angry. Well, isn't it a fact that your so-called business trips included a weekend in a secluded cottage on Lake Como with Mrs. Evans? We had to change our plans and go there to meet with these league officials. It was the only cottage that was available. There was nothing wrong with it. And didn't Mrs. Evans buy you two $500 silk suits? She wanted me to make a good impression on potential backers. It was just a loan until we got home. On the way back from Italy, didn't the two of you spend a weekend at a luxury condo of a friend of Mrs. Evans in New York? 
That was just the way the flight schedule worked out. We couldn't get a hotel. I see thousands of hotels in New York City, and you couldn't find a room. Objection, well, Your convenient. Honor. All right, all right that, that's argumentative. I'm going to sustain the objection. I have no further questions. All right, you may step down. Matt, can I see you? Please? While Tony Cross leaves the stand, we have time for a break. We return now to divorce court. About to testify in behalf of Tony Cross is Bettina Evans. All right, Mr. Rummer, let me hear from this witness. Thank you, Your Honor. Mrs. Evans, since you are a witness to the fundraising activities of the Crosses, would you say that Mr. Cross was supportive of his wife? Yes. He would uh, break the ice with his stories about his basketball games, and then he'd introduce her. And then she'd ruin everything by insulting him. She'd say things like, Tony has to be excused for talking so much about that silly game, but the poor boy doesn't know any better. I, I think she thought she was being witty, but it really put people off. Did you ever see Tony Cross use one of his wife's functions in order to promote his own team? Never. But at, um, at Tony's and my 15th high school reunion, she started pouting because people were paying attention to him and not to her. As a member of the local ballet guild, can you tell the court if the guild supported Mrs. Cross's efforts to begin a ballet school and company? At first we did, but things did not develop fast enough for her. And at one meeting, she even called me, her biggest supporter, uh, a lazy dilettante. After that, it was difficult to find anybody to help her. Mrs. Evans, has Mrs. Cross ever tried to do any personal harm to you? She destroyed my marriage. Um, a few days after that mess in her dressing room, I came home to find her with Charles. And when I asked them what was going on, she got this triumphant gleam in her eye, and she said, I've just been telling your husband what a little whore you are. Unfortunately, uh, Charles then left. No further questions, Your Honor. Cross-examination. Yes, Your Honor. Mrs. Evans, isn't it true that you were the only person at the Ballet Guild who opposed Lana Cross? Well, after she began calling me names I was against her, sure, but I wasn't the only one. In fact, you threatened to withdraw your husband's financial support if anyone voted for Mrs. Cross. Isn't that true? I didn't have to threaten anyone. She ruined things for herself. Didn't you tell your husband that your June 14th meeting in Rome with the Italian League Commission was a big success? It was a big success. It made the whole trip worthwhile. Well, are you aware that the League Commissioner was in the United States all of June negotiating television contracts with American TV? We met with officials of the Italian Commission. I thought one of them was the commissioner. My Italian is not so great. The truth is that you and Mr. Cross spent the entire week not in Rome, but in a secluded villa on Capri. I think we did go to Capri, but I can assure you it was business. I have no further questions. All right, you may step down. Anything further now from the defendant? Uh, the defense rests, Your Honor. Anything?